Welcome back. It's now time to go in depth. Since December 2012, the government and opposition in St. Kitts and Nevis have been engaged in a standoff over a tabling of a no-confidence motion by the opposition. The original no-confidence motion against the Dr. Denzel Douglas administration was tabled in December 2012 by leader of the federal opposition in St. Kitts, Mark Brantley. Since then, two former government ministers have joined the opposition alliance. The alliance has been calling on Prime Minister Denzel Douglas, who has led St. Kitts and Nevis for three terms, to step down and call fresh elections as he now leads an illegal minority in the parliament. Joining me to discuss this matter is the leader of the federal opposition in St. Kitts and he is also the deputy premier of the St. Kitts sister isle, Nevis, Mark Brantley. Welcome, Mr. Brantley. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Good evening to you and to your many listeners, not just in Jamaica, but throughout the world. Thank you. Mr. Brantley, the no-confidence motion tabled nearly two years ago still hasn't been debated. Tell our viewers what compelled the opposition to file the motion to begin with. Well, we had been concerned for some time at what we considered to be the deteriorating situation in the country, a situation of, of very high debt, a situation of uh, uncontrollable uh, crime, a situation where we thought that the country was on the wrong road, uh, they had crept into our body politic a certain coarseness, a certain uh, bombast, a certain approach to, 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 to matters that had to do with the nation. Um, we had, I believe, the style of the Prime Minister has been one of confrontation rather than consultation. And so there were a number of factors, the last of which flowing from the debt issue was the fact that uh, one of the, the prescriptions uh, approved by the IMF was that we would swap large tracts of land in exchange for debt in order to get debt relief. And that was in light of our peculiar history uh, coming out of slavery and uh, a history of landlessness of our people. That was perhaps the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. We also had a situation where the Prime Minister uh, then had a majority, we have 11 electoral seats, he had at the time seven, and we in the opposition had the other four. Well, two of his most senior uh, members left his party and uh, have crossed the floor and now sit with us, giving us a majority of six elected members. We therefore understood that based on the numbers, a motion of no confidence would carry. And I think the Prime Minister also understood that, and he has therefore used every conceivable ruse now for two years to avoid that matter going to Parliament. Our response as an opposition has been to boycott the sitting of the Parliament. We think that it is illegitimate. We do not believe, based on our constitutional provisions, that a Prime Minister who cannot command a majority of elected members ought to continue in that role. We have sought to engage the courts. We have sought to engage the Head of State, the Governor General. We have even sought to engage our colleagues at the CARICOM level, all to no avail. Indeed, the CARICOM response was particularly disappointing because Dr. Gonzalez of St. Vincent and the Grenadines suggested that since all was calm and we had not taken to the streets and there was no rioting, then we basically did not have a crisis in St. Kitts and Nevis. We are concerned because, as we know, anybody who follows parliamentary democracies based on the Westminster model that we employ, and that is employed throughout the Commonwealth. We understand that the motion of no confidence is one of the most serious matters that can confront any parliament. And all of the learning that we've looked at says that it must be dealt with as a matter of urgency ahead of any other business. And uh, the consequence that we have been dealt here is that in St. Kitts and Nevis, we've had a minority government holding on now for two years. To add insult to injury, that minority government is now uh, speedily trying to change electoral boundaries. And so we now have that double whammy, if you will, of a minority government which does not support, have the support of a majority of elected members and added to that a frenzy that is now afoot to alter boundaries in what we have termed a, a rank exercise of gerrymandering. So we have had a prime minister who's now been prime minister. This is his fourth term, and that would make him a prime minister for some 20 years and he is still trying to hold on uh, by any means necessary. And so this is the unfortunate situation that we face currently in our parliament in St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay, now you have taken the matter to court. 
And the court has ruled that the matter should be tabled in Parliament so the motion can be debated. But the Speaker is appealing that ruling and secured a delay in the High Court on Thursday. Tell us the latest on that court battle. Well, yes, the Speaker has been trying his best to delay. Um, indeed, the matter that is currently before the court, after we had endured some three months or so of this matter not being called, notwithstanding that the Speaker had indicated in writing that the matter would be treated with some urgency. After over three months, the matter having not been called, we actually moved the court. When we moved the court, the Speaker then said as his excuse that the matter was before the court and as a consequence could not be called. We therefore withdrew the matter from the court, at which point he then said that he had questions that he wished the court to determine, and so the matter, as far as he was concerned, will continue to be in the court. A very convenient argument, no doubt. Um, what has since happened, though, is that while the motion that has been filed by myself as leader of the opposition has remained unheard in two years and has not even been tabled, it has not even been put on the order paper in the parliament in two years, uh, my colleagues, the Honorable Sean Richards and most recently the Honorable Dr. Timothy Harris, both have themselves filed separate motions of no confidence. The Speaker has now indicated that notwithstanding that those motions have nothing to do with the first and are separate and distinct, that as far as he's concerned, as he put it, Dr. Harris's motion is dead on arrival. And so he has made it quite clear that he has absolutely no intentions of calling any motion of no confidence in this government. He has clearly demonstrated his partisanship, and it is for that reason that we have also resisted what we have called given any soccer, any sense of legitimacy to what is obviously a parliamentary mockery in the region. Insofar as our case is concerned, the case that I'm dealing with, um, after we joined the case and the Speaker insisting that he will proceed with the matter, we have joined. The court has already ruled in a reasoned and lengthy decision. The judge indicated there was absolutely no reason why the motion should not be before the Parliament and, of course, commented on the obvious fact that under our Constitution, the legitimacy of any Prime Minister comes from him commanding a majority of support in Parliament. The Speaker has seen it fit to appeal that decision, but we understand this is just a play for time. And so far, they've bought now two years, and we've sort of, if you will, limped along for these two years. Uh, it is, I believe, a matter of, of great restraint on the part of the elected majority, that we have sought to exhaust all constitutional avenues. We have appealed to colleagues within the region. We have appealed to the international community to take a look at what is happening in St. Kitts and Nevis and to really send a very clear signal, diplomatically and otherwise, that what is happening is unacceptable. It sets a very, very dangerous precedent for the region that governments that have lost popularity and have lost the the majority in the parliament can still hold on simply by ignoring motions that are brought and motions that have been accepted are a part of our constitution and a part of our parliamentary system. So the, the court case now uh, has progressed. The matter went up to the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal has now sent it back for a speedy trial, and I'm told that that speedy trial ought to occur very shortly. Uh, but, of course, at this juncture, we have an election that is now constitutionally due in any event within the next three to four months or thereabouts. And so we, while we would still wish for the court to pronounce in these matters, the truth is that the prime minister has run the clock, and he has been allowed to extend his life, if you will, as prime minister for an additional two years with this motion not being heard, and none of the new motions also being heard because, as I indicated, the Speaker has said that they're dead on arrival. The opposition has picketed the House of the Speaker's place of employment and even written to the Governor-General to have the Prime Minister ousted. Have any of these measures borne fruit? None of those measures have borne fruit in the sense that the Governor-General has remained unmoved. I, I don't know if I can find the words to describe how our constitutional mechanisms have simply fallen apart in St. Kitts and our Governor General's head of state, we have written to him formal correspondence. He does not even acknowledge that he received correspondence. He does not respond. Uh, the Prime Minister is emboldened in much of his actions because he somehow uh, seems to have uh, control in terms of control over the head of state, control over the speaker, 
And as a consequence, what ought to be independent bodies and independent individuals, people who ought to be guided by the Constitution and only by the Constitution, appear instead to be guided by party politics. And so we are unable to move the constitutional agenda forward. We are unable to move in the direction that parliamentary democracy, well-respected, well-regarded, and settled procedures throughout the Commonwealth would dictate. We've been unable to move forward at all. So the truth is, I believe, that we have conducted ourselves with remarkable restraint. We have sought to do the necessaries in sense of writing and agitating within the boundaries of the law. But we have not, in my view, been able to move this matter forward because we have functionaries who are not prepared to carry out their constitutional duties. Now, Mr. Well, Brantley... prepared instead to preserve and maintain a, a government which has lost the majority. Yes, Mr. Brantley, general elections in St. Kitts are, and Nevis are due next year. So, with elections so close, why not just wait until he calls it to get your own mandate? Well, th that may well now be the result, and that is what I said earlier. The reality is, however, that it doesn't excuse the fact that for two years we have now, I believe, entered the history books in the region. I can't, we cannot find any parallel anywhere. Uh, in Grenada recently, we had motions of no confidence, and we had a parliament being prorogued, um, at but subsequently an election. And if the results in Grenada are any indication, it is suggesting that sitting governments that have lost the mandate and have lost popularity, they can run, but ultimately they can't hide. In Grenada, the then government at the polls lost all the seats. Okay, and, so and on we expect no less a result in saying it's a Nevis when an election comes. All right. On but Saturday, the fact it's an election. Mr. Brantley, is I'm sorry, running out of time, but sure. just fine, before we go, on Saturday, the Canadian government announced that St. Kitts and Nevis citizens now require a visa to travel there. The U.S. has also expressed concerns about your economic citizenship program, but the government says it's sound. What are the opposition's concerns? Well, we're deeply concerned. We think that the, the writing has been on the wall for some time. We feel that both the United States and Canada have uh, made representations. We are aware that several private representations have been made before these public utterances. I feel that the stance now taken by Canada is a huge blow to the pride and dignity of our country. We have always enjoyed visa-free travel to Canada, and to have that suspended, have that removed summarily, is a huge blow to us. And at the end of the day, we have to ask, for what? Because Canada isn't concerned about naturally born and bred petitions and divisions. Canada is concerned about people whom they have termed uh, actors, illicit actors in some cases, gaining access to our citizenship through this program. All right, thank you we, so we very much. We have always insisted that the program needs to be tightened up in terms of security measures. Those pleas have fallen on their fears, and I think the people must now and are now required to pay the price. All right, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Brantley. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to speaking to you again. All right, no problem. Do you just heard there from Mark Brantley, leader of the federal opposition in St. Kitts and Nevis. That's it for In-Depth. Stick around for sports.